A new league, eight new teams. Beginning of an era, the Chargers' most explosive runner, Paul Lowe, again shows his ability to break tackle. Race the 25 yards and a touchdown. Noted for his bullet passes, Kemp fires one to Kasuri. Kemp shows his versatility. He elects to run and picks up six yards. John Hadel strikes again, finding Allworth in the open. Touchdown. And it's all with again, this time on the reverse. Hadle to Lincoln to Lance, and off he goes. Dublin Road masterfully executes a draw play to Lincoln. Big post rifles through the defense. He's belly on blue ring. Drops the quarterback. Looking. Fires it long downfield. He's got Joyner. Touchdown. Now Charlie Joyner is the all-time leading receiver in the history of the National Football League. He's going for Jefferson. The legend of the lightning bolt is now a half century old. The San Diego Chargers of today are the standard bearers of a football franchise whose history stands two different cities and two different leagues. The Chargers were born when the American Football League was created in 1959. Its founders were eight businessmen known as the Foolish Club. Among its members was hotel and credit card magnate Baron Hilton, who appropriately named his Los Angeles-based team the Chargers. Hilton's choice to lead the Chargers was the former coach of the crosstown rival Rams. The new league was coming up and I got a call from Baron Hilton. Wanted to know whether I'd be interested in going with the Chargers. And I was certainly interested in going. I thought I was going to selling stocks and bonds <laughs> and learning a new profession did quite appeal to me. We had tryout camps. We had every truck driver, every bartender in the entire area that felt that he could play professional football. We must have had a thousand people try out for our, our football team. Out of all these hundreds of guys that we ran and tried out and blocked and, uh, Two people out of, out of that whole bunch made it. Among the new players included Paul Lowe, a former mailroom clerk in Hilton's credit card company. Lowe made sure that the first play in Chargers history would be a memorable one. Uh, the very first game in the L.A. Coliseum for the uh, new American Football League was Paul Lowe running against the Titans 105 yards for a touchdown on the opening kickoff of the opening game of the AFL back in 1960. So it was wide open. The games were fun. In Jack Kemp, the Chargers had a quarterback perfectly suited to the pass-happy style of the new league. I think I was probably the only player in the uh, in pro football that didn't hold the laces. I put the laces right in the middle of my hand. It just felt good with the seam along the uh, ridge of my fingers. I had big hands, so that was my grip, and I could throw a football. I couldn't always hit somebody with it, but I could throw it pretty hard. I hit a guy in the hand one time and split his finger right down at the middle. Jack threw hard and ran hard, but there were hardly any fans in the cavernous Coliseum to watch Kemp and the Chargers. 
even as they rolled to a division title in their opening season. My AFL experiences started with the Los Angeles Chargers. We used to tell people that they didn't introduce us on the PA system. We would go through the stands and shake hands with everybody because there were so few people. If L.A. didn't support the team, there was another Southern California city eager to welcome the Chargers. After various meetings between the mayor and Baron Hilton, San Diego City Council, meeting an executive session in the council chambers, invited the Chargers to come to San Diego. Now the San Diego Chargers are a reality and will play their games and remodel Balboa Stadium in the fall of 1961. And when you think of Balboa Stadium, you think of the water closets overflowing, which they sometimes did, and the water would uh, flow down over the cement seats. Probably one of the most uncomfortable stadiums in America, but it had great sight lines, and it was a place where San Diego really embraced the Chargers. San Diego had been kind of in the doldrums here following World War II, and what was needed was a catalyst, something that would bring the community together, and the Chargers became that catalyst. The Chargers' on-field catalyst was Paul Lowe, a former collegiate high hurdler perfectly suited for San Diego's high-octane attack. Sid had a wide-open offense. I used to love the run would be sweet because once I got outside, I don't think anybody could catch me, you know. I could set up blocks pretty well. Paul Lowe was probably one of the great pure runners of all time. He could run right and then turn around and run left. In fact, I separated both my shoulders trying to block for Paul Lowe when he would run to the right, get trapped, and then circle around and run left. One of the great runs of the season, Lowe runs into trouble, completely reverses his field and races for 25 yards in a touchdown. Only one AFL back gained more career yards than Lowe, who finished with the best yards per carry average in league history. For that, Paul could credit the unselfish attitude of his backfield running mate. Paul was much smarter than I. He demonstrated continuously to the, to the coaching staff that he wasn't a good blocker. And, and, and so then he'd say, well, let Lincoln block for me and I'll carry the ball. I think I was a stronger runner inside between tackles than that. I still had the speed to get outside and do that, and I'd run the pitch in that also. But one thing I never did, I never gained 1,000 yards in my life. In one year, I averaged, I think, 6.8 a carry for the season, another time five-something. But I wouldn't carry the ball that much. While Lincoln and Lowe were piling up yardage on the ground, Gilman could also be pleased with the performance of his defense. In 1961... The Chargers set a pro football record that still stands. An astonishing 49 pass interceptions in a single season. The interceptions, the record was due to the pass rush. We had some great defensive backs and some good linebackers that took advantage of that. They put such pressure on people that when those quarterbacks got rid of the ball, we didn't have too far to run to get to it. Allen, number 50, was but one of many past thieves on the Chargers who benefited from the talents of San Diego's disruptive front four. Its two main stars were menacing defensive tackle Ernie Ladd and quick-footed defensive end Earl Faison. Earl, 6'6", 295. He said, you know, I think he was probably more like 320. And Ernie Ladd, 6'9", 340 pounds. His eyes looked like they weighed about a pound each. And a great, great athlete. He was super. Faison and Ladd anchored a defense that led to Western Division titles in 1960 and 61. But each season ended with disappointing losses to the Houston Oilers in the AFL Championship game. After an injury-riddled San Diego squad posted a losing record in 1962, the Chargers head coach had seen enough. In 1963, Sid Gilman got an idea, and that is we would take away all distractions from these players, we'll isolate them somewhere away from everybody, and so the focus will be entirely on football. 
So with that in mind, he took us to a place called Boulevard, California, in the high desert, at a place that was a failed dude ranch. The ranch's name, Rough Acres, could not have been more appropriate. I go into my cabin. Toilets don't work. No showers. So I uh, spend that evening there. The next morning, I'm awakened by a cow with his head looking in my window, and he's mooing at me. We was warming up, and we got to practice. So I put my helmet down, and I saw this bracelet there. And I saw the guys up there stomping and stomping and hitting it, you know, by my helmet. I said, what the heck is, where's my helmet? You know, they take my helmet, killing this snake, who I thought was a, a, dime, was a diamondback rattler. And I thought it was a little old bracelet I was going to, you know, give to my wife, you know. <laughs> After we finished camp in Rough Acres, and we was in shape, we was ready to play. We had a successful season. We had a real good season, you would say. 1963 wasn't merely a good season. It was the most successful in Chargers history. With the speed we had with Allworth and, uh, and Norton and uh, Dave Kasurik, we had fast receivers all the way across the field, and we could really stretch them out. Probably had more speed than any other team I'd ever played on. That receiving talent was harnessed by Roach. A 13-year veteran quarterback who the Chargers signed after winning his rights in a coin flip. Tobin was probably the element that made our team a championship team. We had a lot of young, great football players, and Tobin had a stabilizing effect on the team because he was so mature. I can remember when he was, at the time, he called all the plays. They weren't sent in. And I remember the first couple of games we played and Tobin would call playing, I'd say to myself, never going to work. And lo and behold, 15, 20 yards. <clears throat> After a while, I was like, whatever Tobin calls, we're going to do it. <laughs> In the title game against Boston, the Chargers would not be denied. On the second play from scrimmage, Keith Lincoln exploded for 56 yards. And the biggest route in AFL championship game history was on. The greatest thing about it, I thought, was we got off to a quick start, which changed what the Patriots could do to us, and they had to get out of their game plan and try to play catch-up ball with us. And I think that's what got the momentum going for us and allowed us to get that somewhat easy victory. Lincoln totaled 349 all-purpose yards as San Diego came as close to perfection as any football team ever has. It was just one of those days. Everything went right. Keith Lincoln accounted for more than 200 yards. Our passing game went well. I don't think there was any real phase of it that uh, we were disappointed that we gave him 10 points, to be honest with you. The third time had proven to be the charm. At long last, the Chargers were champions of the American Football League. Following their fourth division crown a year later, the Chargers shuffled off to Buffalo to defend their league title and jumped to an early lead. But what soon followed was a single play that altered the course of franchise history. The rush is getting on, on Tobin, and so he's got to dump the ball. He's looking, it's almost the way he threw it out of the pocket. It was almost like throwing a, a snowball down the chimney. And just as I caught the ball, Stratton hit me. Lincoln was finished, and so were the Chargers. The Bills went on to win the 64 title, then shut out San Diego again a year later in a championship rematch. So Sid Gilman went back to the drawing board in search of new ways to bolster his offense. His pioneering discoveries would change the game of football forever. When the coach says, I've got to establish the running game, he is, if you'll excuse me, camera, full of <laughs> <laughs> You've got to establish the pass. If I can establish the pass, I'll be able to run. Tackle Ron Nix led the way on the Chargers sweep, a run play that flourished because of Gilman's overall offensive philosophy. 
Sid's concepts were light years ahead of any coach in either the AFL or NFL. I feel affectionately toward him, and so do all players I've ever spoken to. And maybe it's because he's just like one of a kind, you know? You just admire that Wild West spirit. We literally raised offensive football to an art form. It was unbelievable. We were just, boom, exploding all over the field. The man who brought Sid's ideas to life was number 19, Hall of Fame receiver Lance Allworth. If they throw the ball, I don't care what kind of route that I would run or, or, or whatever, but when they threw the ball, the ball was mine. If I didn't get it, nobody else was going to get it. And, you know, I think that that's what separates a lot of the guys. Gilman's sophisticated offense was based on precision and timing. Even the slightest mistake would infuriate the demanding Chargers coach. Well, Sid was the, the ultimate taskmaster. He was uh, disciplined and tough, and he had to be mean. You know, all the qualities that you'd love to see in a prison warden, you know, but he was our coach. Don't fall on the inside, up the field! Better let the little guy take it again. This bastard, he's too stupid. Go ahead, Speedy. I want you to stay in there, but you tell me when you want a little blow, because this guy is worth a Dynamic. Tough. <laughs> Very disciplined. He was so dedicated and, and spent the hours, and he loved it. He did expect you to perform and do exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted robots out there. I mean, if he could have had them out there and competed, he would have won every game. Take a drive corner, Lance, you know, coming in from a good wide position and starting right down that middle and then breaking it off and taking it to the corner. You'll lose him. You'll lose him. You'll lose him. The field is 100 yards long. And it's 53 and, a, and a two-thirds yards wide. See? And we decided we're going to use every inch of it. We divided the field up into sections. The outside section, the number area, the inside area, the hash area. We felt if we could put a person in these areas, right along the line, that nobody could cover us. It seemed as if Gilman's teams showcased a groundbreaking innovation every week. But his advances weren't limited to just the playing field. He was an innovator, not only in the techniques of professional football, but he was the first professional football coach, and that was 1963, to recognize the importance of weight training. He was the first coach, probably in college or professional football, to designate roommates by position. And he did it for a purpose, and that was to integrate the team. He was the only one who was doing it. And this is in the early 60s. Most NFL teams maybe had three to five black players. The Chargers had 10 to 15. He said it was colorblind. Whoever would help the team, whoever was the best player, he judged people just on their ability on the field. That's what athletics is supposed to be about. We loved one another. Whites loved the blacks as well as the blacks loved the white ball players. We thought we had an outstanding team of personalities beyond our football abilities. And I'm just thankful that I came along during that time because I could have been with a team that responded very negative, you know, and we had a relation with white players that you could take to the bank. Ron Mix, John Hayden, these are great, outstanding players that had a lot of character. By 1965, Hadel was in charge even if he didn't quite look the part of a pro quarterback. John was never a stylist. He never looked that good on the field. He was kind of a thick kind of a guy. To me, the thing that separated him from everybody else was that he could throw a 50-yard pass as accurately as he could a 10-yard pass. He was just a extremely accurate uh, long passer, which, of course, fitted him very nicely with Lance because... Nobody could go deep any better than Lance. Hadel to Allworth became the AFL's most feared passing combination. 
and eclectic because they were dedicated disciples of the gospel according to St. Sid. He's a great guy. I love Sid. He really taught me how to work. In my first five years, I didn't have a day off during the season. We'd, I'd be in there Monday morning, uh, 8 o'clock, and uh, we'd go through the whole thing. That's when I really learned the game of football. San Diego star performers would take their act to a glittering new stage at the end of 1966, bidding farewell to Balboa Stadium for a state-of-the-art home in Mission Valley. You'll want to be in the plush new San Diego Stadium next season for all the action and thrills of Charger football. The stadium's unique form is designed for maximum visibility and comfort for the fans. America's newest sports facility has everything. And the Chargers are determined to make 1967 a championship season. This is Coach Sid Gilman. Our goal this year is to put a championship team into this great stadium. I know you will enjoy watching the San Diego Chargers. It is going to be a big play and a big win team. There would be no more championships under Gilman. But the big plays kept coming. Thanks to such past targets as former San Diego State receiver Gary Garrison, number 27. Another new star for the new stadium was a half pint half back with dazzling moves, number 22, Dickie Post. I ran to daylight. I, I can't really describe the style. If I saw daylight, well, then that's pretty much where I took it. I was more of a, a nervous runner, probably, than, uh, uh, than anybody else. It consumed so much energy by the half, I was totally exhausted. It's not a style that anybody would want to copy if you can find somebody else. It worked for me. Post won Rookie of the Year honors in 1967 and the league rushing crown in 69 as a key contributor in a prolific Chargers attack. When we went into a game offensively, we knew we were going to score a lot of points. We didn't know what our defense was going to do, but we knew we could score a lot of points against anybody we played against because of the way we, we manipulated everybody. Scoring points was not Sid Gilman's problem. The Achilles heel for the Chargers in the late 60s was their defense. In spite of such solid performers as Steve DeLong, Bob Babbage, Rick Redman, and Joe Bochap, San Diego gave up nearly as many points as it scored. On occasion, defenders like number 33, safety Kenny Graham, manufactured their own touchdowns. And on special teams, there was no better kick returner in the entire AFL than number 45, Leslie Speedy Duncan. many ways to come up with a big play, little Speedy Duncan knows them all. An American Football League record coming up, Duncan picks off a Len Dawson pass and returns it 100 yards. Overall, the decade of the 1960s was the most successful in team history. Five division titles, a world championship, and nine winning seasons in 10 years, a distinction no other AFL team could match. With an NFL-AFL merger coming in 1970, San Diego was afforded the honor of hosting the last ever regular season AFL game. It marked the end of an era for a league, a team, and one of the Chargers' greatest football players. San Diego took a break to honor their nine-time All-Pro offensive tackle, Ron Mix. Mix had previously announced his retirement as the last of the original Chargers. But before he left, he opened a hole for another superstar, little Dickie Post. It was the perfect curtain call. The Chargers bid farewell to the American Football League and eagerly anticipated their entry into the NFL. The Chargers entered the new decade with many of the old familiar faces that had brought success in the 1960s. John Hadel still threw to Lance Allworth, and both benefited from the precision blocking of number 78, guard Walt Sweeney. 
Sweeney earned All-Star or Pro Bowl berths nine times during his distinguished career, clearing pathways for such runners as number 20, Mike Garrett. The only back in football history to rush for 1,000-yard seasons in both the AFL and NFL. What I try to do is keep you off balance. I was not the fastest person in the world, but I was terribly quick. And I felt if I can get you to at a standing position, and then I would give you a move by giving you different moves back and forth, that I can make you break down, as we say, and get in a hitting position. Then I can outquick you from the start. And that's basically how I try to do it. And with my quickness and ability to take a pounding, I did fairly well in professional football. Despite Garrett's performance, Sid Gilman's Chargers did not enjoy much success during their first two years in the NFL. Following consecutive losing seasons in 1970 and 71, owner Gene Klein replaced Gilman, the longest tenured coach in Chargers history, with general manager Harlan Swarry. The first thing Swari did was initiate a flurry of trades, moves that exchanged one set of veteran players for another. There was a big question mark as to who was going to be the quarterback after they traded John Hadel to the Rams. Uh, and they were bringing in a number of veteran players who had marquee value. None was better known than John Unitas, widely regarded as the greatest pro quarterback ever. The key question was, could the 40-year-old legend still play? I think they felt that United had a year or two left. We had a lot of veterans on the team, a lot of guys that had been at other teams. I think what the, the organization was trying to do was copy George Allen and the success he had with the Redskins. It was the old-timers and the troublemakers, as, you know, as they were labeled. Wonderful talent, maybe too many personalities um, on their own agenda, not as a team. Those Charger teams had real characters. They had Tim Rosovich, who once leaped into Mission Bay with a cast on his leg. He would eat fire. They had Deacon Jones, who was uh, very voluble. There were a lot of guys around that team that made great interviews. They just weren't a very good team. We did not have the right combination to get to winning. But as a football player, you always think you can pull it out. You always think you can do it. But then you find out that you ain't as good as you used to be. And now you're playing with insufficient talent and an insufficient system. So therefore, you don't reach your goals anymore. But you see where the deck is stacked against you. And all you're going to get out of this is a whipping. Big names did not translate into big wins. The Chargers finished last in 72 and 73 as the eroding skills of their aging ball players became painfully evident. For Unitas, the low point occurred in his hometown during a lopsided loss to the Steelers. The game just was a nightmare for Unitas. At that point, the Chargers turned to their uh, then rookie Dan Fouts. Fouts rallied the Chargers dramatically one of those ships passing in the night games. One guy coming and one guy going. It was a historic game, really, for the Chargers because it marked the arrival of, uh, of Fouts, who from that point would be their leading quarterback. Fouts, in a lot of ways, was a lot like Unitas. He was a guy who insisted on being the leader, and he was a great leader. You could look him up in the Hall of Fame. He's in there with Unitas. But Fouts' best seasons were still a few years in the future. For the moment, he was a young quarterback still learning the ropes and heavily dependent upon such teammates as surprise running sensation Don Woods, number 33. We picked him up off of waivers from Green Bay and we were playing in Cincinnati. And uh, I remember him coming into the game, and I handed him the ball, and he went like 21 yards for a first down. And as he comes back to the huddle, I stuck out my hand to shake his hand and pull him forward so I could read his name on the back of his jersey to see who he was. I said, way to go, Woods. Woods electrified the NFL in 1974, 
setting an NFL record for yards rushing by a rookie, while also breaking San Diego's single-season rushing total held by Paul Lowe. Injuries limited his productivity during the rest of his career, but the waiver fee to obtain Woods remains the best $100 the Chargers ever spent. The talent San Diego acquired in the NFL draft enjoyed far greater longevity. No less than eight future starters were selected in 1975. San Diego Chargers first round selection is Gary Johnson, defensive tackle, Grambling. With the arrival of Johnson, future Hall of Famer Fred Dean, number 71, and defensive tackle Louis Kelcher, number 74, the Chargers now have the makings of one of the best front four units in league history. The mastermind behind San Diego's draft was new head coach Tommy Prothrow. Prothrow had a keen eye for evaluating football talent and a riverboat gambler's daring when it came to unleashing the unexpected. I've always said that I think somebody should always go by percentages except a, a few times break them and when you break them, break them so far that nobody would ever think you'd be stupid enough to go that far against the percentages. Prothrow delighted fans with his gadget plays and was also a source of entertainment for media and players alike who were enthralled by the rumbling baritone of Tommy's Tennessee twang. Prothrow brought down to San Diego with him from the Rams, our tight end, Pat Curran. And a buddy of his was Fred Dreyer, the defensive end for the Rams. And we would get up to the line of scrimmage, and, and Dreyer, who was a great comedian in his own right, would imitate Tommy Prothrow and say, Curran, you're all sides. Your, your butt's too high, and you got no way of coming off the ball and striking a blow. And Curran would yell back, Dreyer, I think you're all sides. Your, your hand is off sides. It's in the neutral zone, uh, Dreyer. Uh, and I'm up at the line of scrimmage going, Blue 33, Blue 30. And I'm hearing this conversation down at the line of scrimmage. What am I supposed to do? Can't call time up, time out, and tell them to shut up. Pro Throw's influence was felt in the next few years as San Diego gradually improved. But then came a fateful moment against the Raiders and a day that will live in Chargers infamy. It was an important game for us. It was early in the season. We had won our opener, looking to go 2-0. and And I know Tommy Prothrow felt that we were a pretty good ball club. And we had beaten the Raiders up and down the field that whole day. The Chargers led by six with 10 seconds remaining. What followed was a dubious turn of dastardly events that historians eventually called the Holy Roller. It was part cartoon and, and part Rod Serling. And like I say, all surreal. As the play started to unwind, it just became a, a cartoon of comedy of errors. I cannot think of, of, of a more outrageous uh, form of, of outright raider thievery and cheating that, that's ever occurred. I thought I had sacked Kenny. And the last time I talked to him, you know, we was from the same alma mater, University of Alabama. I thought, I said, Kenny, you sly. I mean, really. I thought I had sacked the guy. And the next thing I knew, I looked back in the end zone, and I see the official going up with a touchdown. I was heartbroken, devastated. I think the short-term effect was that we came out a little flat next week, and we got blasted pretty badly, I believe, by Green Bay. And it eventually led to Tommy Prothrow stepping down. I think we were 1-3 and three at the time and really going nowhere, and uh, we heard a rumor in the locker room that Prothrow was quitting. And Prothrow came in, to his credit, addressed the team, 
told us basically that he was disappointed in the way things have turned out and wished us well and walked out of the room very slowly. And then into the room comes this little whirlwind, Don Coriel. Don Coriel was going to be our coach. And I remember him saying, you know, people think I'm crazy to take this job. You guys are one and three. You haven't won in a long time. Well, guys, I tell you what, we all got to be a little bit crazy to play this game. And with that, we all started laughing, and we never stopped laughing until it was over. San Diego fans were familiar with Don Coriel. The winningest coach in San Diego State history led the Aztecs to 104 victories with his wide-open pass offense. Upon his return to San Diego, five weeks into the 1978 season, Don Coriel installed his revolutionary offensive philosophy and game plan, forever changing the NFL. I don't think there's ever been a coach who was more courageous about creating offense. And basically it had to do with, with the passing game, obviously, but also with uh, formations and use of personnel. The Coriel system was all about layering offensive options. There was a tremendous amount of motion, there was a tremendous amount of, of formation change. You've got to spread the field, use the entire field, and then find the mismatch, and then have a trigger person like Dan Fouts, who's smart enough to see the whole field, move the ball around, and get everybody involved. Seeing a player that could do more than one thing. Maybe this tight end could line up outside wide and create a mismatch, you know, like Kellen Winslow. When he moved on to San Diego, and got a great quarterback in Dan Faust and receivers like John Jefferson, Charlie Joyner, and Kellen Winslow. You take those kinds of talents and you put them in that offense, and that's when you have a team that's really going to set records. The Chargers' record-setting offense was beginning to take shape behind the maturation of quarterback Dan Faust and the rejuvenation of receiver Charlie Joyner. When I went to San Diego, I was there almost at the end of my career but Coriel's offense fitted me so well, it was really the start of my career. And I just helped him play um, nine more years. That's the quarterback, looking, fires it long downfield, he's got Joyner, touchdown! For me, it was the best offense in the world. 750 career receptions for over 12,000 yards made Joyner a Hall of Fame lock. But statistics were not the only measure of Joyner's greatness. The real example of, of how good Charlie was is that during training camp, when we have rookies coming in, we would put on a reel of pass routes and show the rookies how to run those pass routes. And the guy running the pass routes, each and every one of them, was Charlie Joyner because he was perfect on every one of his pass routes. One of those rookies was 78's first-round draft pick, John Jefferson a receiver blessed with the necessary tools to become an elite player in the NFL. I just love throwing the ball to him because if I got the ball in the right spot, J.J. was going to catch it. Incredible ability to focus on the ball regardless of the situation. If he was in the corner of the end zone, you know, putting one hand up, uh, pulling it in, getting his feet down, or in a crowd along the sidelines. He made so many incredible catches. Wow, the things he could do with his body. The ability to catch the football. Every team has that player, or should have that player, that when they step on the field, the fans come to their feet, simply because he's on the field. You know, that was JJ. Another weapon in the Chargers arsenal was Rolf Bernerska. The young kicker proved to be the most accurate kicker in the league, with a knack for making game-winning field goals. Aided by Bernerska's clutch kicking, the Chargers won seven of their final eight games to finish 1978 at 9-7, the franchise's first winning season since 1969. 
The strong finish resulted in raised expectations the following year. A playoff berth was anticipated in Don Coryell's first full season. It was evident early in 1979 that the Chargers had become the most exciting team in football. And a craze known as Charger Power swept San Diego. It was just something that was totally natural. And the crowd, I mean, you were there to entertain. You felt like an entertainer. And, you know, I feel the vibes and it was nothing designed. Fueled by fan support, Charlie Joyner and John Jefferson had spectacular seasons, each surpassing 1,000 receiving yards. Dan Fouts had the most prolific passing season the NFL had ever seen. Fouts set an NFL record by passing for over 300 yards in four consecutive games on his way to setting the NFL's single-season passing record. Charger power did not only reside on the offensive side of the ball. Despite a season-ending knee injury to Louis Kelcher, the defense, led by Leroy Jones and pro bowlers Mean Fred Dean and Gary Big Hands Johnson, applied constant pressure to the quarterback. The linebackers, led by number 51 Woodrow Lowe, were there to clean up anything that was remaining. San Diego limited opponents to the fewest points of the AFC. The Chargers were well prepared for a playoff run. But first, they'd have to get past the defending Super Bowl champions. Inspired by a pregame appearance from Rolf Bernerska, who was recovering from a life-threatening illness, the Chargers played one of their finest games of the season. The visiting Steelers never stood a chance. The ball-hawking Chargers defense created seven takeaways. Fouts passed for two touchdowns, and Jefferson gained over 100 yards. San Diego passed the litmus test, defeating the Steel Curtain, proving they were among the NFL's elite. A stature achieved in large part to the play of the most complete defensive unit of the Coriel era. The defense excelled down the stretch, holding opponents to seven points or less in four of the final five games, including a Monday night showdown versus the Broncos with the AFC West title on the line. Bouts connected with Joyner to give the Chargers the lead. Already without an injured Jefferson, and now a hobbled joiner. The defense raised their level of play, creating five turnovers and holding on to the lead. The San Diego Chargers were the 1979 AFC West champions. The celebration was short-lived as the Oilers forced the Chargers into five turnovers sending them home after the first round of the playoffs. As incredible as 1979 was, Charger Power would reach new heights in 1980. Protected by a star-studded offensive line, Dan Fouts was granted time to survey the field. Russ Washington, Ed White, Don Masick, Doug Wilkerson, and Billy Shields, those were the main five for, for those years. Really, when Ed came from Minnesota, he was the missing piece, because that allowed us to move Masick to center and really form a, uh, a tight pocket. Founts benefited from maximum protection to the detriment of Charger foes. The Chargers became the first team in pro football history to average more than 400 yards of offense per game. Dan Fouts broke the single-season passing record he set the year before. Charlie Joyner and John Jefferson each went over 1,000 yards receiving. Jefferson for the third time in his three-year career. 
storming onto the scene and over opponents, Kellen Winslow led the NFL with 89 receptions for over 1,200 yards. He changed his position, and that's about, I think, the most a guy can do. He gave it dimensions that it hadn't had before he came along. He was just so big and so fast. The NFL hadn't seen anything like that before. The key for Kellen was his hands. He could snatch the ball out of the air uh, without a problem and a uh, great desire to do so. He is the standard by which tight ends are judged today and by which tight ends will be judged tomorrow. The Chargers were so loaded with firepower, it hardly seemed fair when they acquired bruising tailback Chuck Muncie midway through the season. Chuck Muncie was special. Size, speed, agility, the ability in open field to run away from somebody, to run over somebody. The most gifted running back to maybe ever play the game. And burn. I've seen them all. Barry Sanders, Love it, Marcus, Emmett, you name them all. Chuck Muncie is the baddest running back I have ever seen. Muncie was not the only imposing figure added to the 1980 Chargers. Fan favorite Louis Kelcher returned after missing nearly all of 79 with an injury. Kelcher, Leroy Jones, Fred Dean, and Gary Johnson stymied opponents, sacking the quarterback more than any unit in the NFL. Kelcher, Dean, and Johnson made the Pro Bowl, marking the first time any team had sent three linemen to Hawaii. At 10 and 5, a Monday night win against the defending Super Bowl champs and consecutive division titles could be had. Kellen Winslow capped off his terrific sophomore campaign by recording 10 catches for 171 yards. The Chargers were playoff bound for the second consecutive season. In the first round, the Buffalo Bills gave the Chargers all they could handle. But Dan Fouts found a streaking Ron Smith to complete another Charger comeback. Fouts to throw, fires a pass down the field, comeback. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, from San Diego, Jack Murphy Stadium. For the first time in their long storied and bitter football rivalry, the Oakland Raiders and the San Diego Chargers meet in a postseason contest. And not just your ordinary postseason contest, but the American Football Conference Championship game and the right to represent the AFC in the Super Bowl in New Orleans. Despite Charlie Joyner's heroics, San Diego was unable to conquer their most hated rival falling in the playoffs for the second year in a row. Disappointment from the loss soon turned to optimism for the season ahead. All the pieces seemed to be in place for a 1981 title run. That is, until contract disputes forced ownership to make some difficult roster changes. Even though one star was leaving, another would soon take his place. Five weeks into the season, Wes Chandler was acquired from New Orleans. San Diego made a great move by getting West because they pretty much got a clone between two guys and their talents. Chandler's on-field production and acrobatics proved to be equally as amazing as his predecessor. The receiving change did not slow Dan Fouts. The Charger QB set the NFL single-season passing record for the third straight season, and the offense continued to excel. Rookie James Brooks led the NFL in total yards. Joyner and Chandler each eclipsed 1,000 receiving yards, as did Kellen Winslow, who led the NFL with 88 receptions. In the most impressive offensive display of the season, Fouts threw for six touchdowns versus the Raiders, four of them to Winslow. Back to throw on third down, and Fouts goes into the end zone. Touchdown, Kellen Winslow. Going to throw 
for it this time. Into the end zone. Winslow! Touchdown! Chargers! Looking in the end zone for Winslow! Touchdown! Winslow added a fifth touchdown reception on a halfback pass from Chuck Munson. The next time the Chargers saw the Raiders, they had an opportunity to clinch the third consecutive AFC West title. Hand off going here to James Brooks. Fifth out of the draft. Determined to overcome previous playoff failures, the Chargers took the field in hot, humid Miami for perhaps the greatest playoff game ever. The Chargers jumped out to an early 24-0 lead, and the game seemed to be in hand. But some dolphin trickery changed everything. Steps up, throws it downfield, it is complete. The lateral back at the 20. Oh, they did it with a gadget. They called the perfect play at the perfect time. I think that play right there affected the defense confidence at that time. Miami battled all the way back and eventually took the lead. Kellen Winslow did everything in his power to make sure that didn't last. Battling injuries and dehydration, Winslow continued to make key plays. Kellen Winslow with a Hall of Fame day, 12 receptions today, but now he's down. That's just fatigue, folks. He has played every play as hard as he could. The tight end persevered and continued to get open for Dan Fouts. Fortunately, on the one play that Winslow could not make, James Brooks was there to pick him up. Throws it toward the end zone. Touchdown, San Diego. Catching it with James Brooks. Following two blocked field goals by the Chargers, including one by Winslow, San Diego finally had a chance to win in overtime, thanks to a pair of key receptions by Charlie Joyner. Chargers move on to the AFC Championship game. Everybody gets the game ball, of course. From the heat of Miami to the most frigid of conditions. The Bengals were not the only foe in Cincinnati. A 59 degree below wind chill and 30 mile per hour wind gusts grounded the Chargers. Unable to conquer the Bengals or the elements, Eric Coriel's Super Bowl hopes were derailed on that blustery day in Cincinnati. Despite the frustrating end to 1981, Don Coriel kept the team on course, and they returned to the playoffs for a fourth consecutive season in 1982. The offense continued to put up record numbers over the next few seasons. Luther back to throw, completes it to Joyner at the 50, and now Charlie Joyner is the all-time leading receiver in the history of the National Football League. With their places in history cemented, aging legends Don Coriel and Charlie Joyner walked away from the game in 1986. A Canton-bound Dan Fouts followed a year later retiring as the second leading passer in NFL history. I am retiring as a uh, an active player in the NFL. And it's just that after 15 years and uh, this body's taken about as many hits as it can and it's it's just time for me to move on to a, a new phase, uh, another phase of my life and, and I'm really looking forward to it. Despite the changes in personnel, exciting football remained the constant for Charger fans, thanks to the commitment of Alex G. Spanos, who purchased the team in 1984. Spanos, a self-made man, owner of A.G. Spanos, one of the nation's most successful family-owned construction companies, fulfilled a lifelong dream when he purchased the Chargers. It was more of an emotional purchase than anything else. I've always wanted to own my own ball club. 
but I just went out and did it, and I've never been happier for it. I'm a winner in my business. I always have been. My track record speaks for itself. I'm trying to build the same thing in football, and the only way to get there is to get the best talent that's out there. Under Spanos, the Chargers continued to field one of the most talented teams in the NFL. Gil Bird, the two-time Pro Bowl corner, had 42 career interceptions. Number 54, Billy Ray Smith, was the Chargers Defensive Player of the Year in 85 and 86, and the team MVP in 87. Lee Williams was a force of the edge, recording 82 and a half career sacks. Three-time Pro Bowler Jim Lachey locked out opposing pass rushers. Gary Anderson gained over 2,000 all-purpose yards in a 1986 Pro Bowl campaign. And Lionel Little Train James was pound for pound the most exciting player in football for five seasons. They will sweep to the right side with Lionel James. 15, 10, 5, In 1992, Alex Spanos and general manager Bobby Bethard found a man who could harness the team's young talent and bring back Charger power. Bobby Ross turned to newly acquired quarterback Stan Humphreys and veteran receiver Anthony Miller to lead the Chargers offense. Throws downfield, he's got a receiver. It's a touchdown. We got Stan and it made a big difference to us. I mean, he was... He, he got the ship going in the right direction. He was really a talented quarterback, just an incredibly talented guy. Throwing a deep one, Rock. Cut! Touchdown! One and over the shoulder kick! Bruising back, Marion Butts steamrolled opponents, providing balance to the offense. The physical runner averaged over four yards per carry in his five seasons with the Chargers. The defense was led by number 91, sack master Leslie O'Neill. O'Neill, one of the all-time great pass rushers, recorded double-digit sacks eight times in his career. He doesn't make a mistake. He's a technician. Uh, he's a great, great player. And, uh, you know, he, he leads by example. And um, he's, a, he's a player that I looked at and I, I learned from. The exuberant young Seau quickly became one of the most dominant defenders in the league. Under Ross's tutelage, the young Charger stars made their first playoff appearance since 1982. This ain't supposed to rain in San Diego, is it? You gotta play football, man. No excuses today. No excuses. You gotta get dirty today. Don't worry about getting dirty. Marion Butts did most of the dirty work. Rushing from 119 yards in a wild card win. Oh, about a second, two up the middle, big old bus. He'll be chased into the end zone. Touchdown, San Diego. I've lost my voice, but try to understand. Once again, I just want to say thanks, fellas. I can't tell you how happy I am today. San Diego fans knew something special was in the air when the 1994 season opened with a dramatic 37-34 come from behind victory over Denver. Humphrey started the comeback with a touchdown pass to tight end Alfred Papuna. The key play was a 99-yard interception return for a touchdown by the man they called the Sheriff. Hey, come up to the 20-yard line, to the 30, to the 40, to the 50. It's going to be a touchdown. And in for the score, Stanley Richard. Taking it one game at a time, one game at a time. You know, we're trying to get to the big show. Second year back, Natron Means exploded onto the scene in 94. 
rushing for over 1,300 yards, punishing opponents in the process. Means 12 rushing touchdowns were second most in the NFL. After starting the season 6-0, the Chargers dropped four of their final eight games. That would be forgotten with a win over the Jets, clinching a playoff berth. The last two weeks, we haven't got it done. Let's get it done this week. Stan Humphreys and Tony Martin got it done. San Diego would need all 60 minutes to overcome a 21-6 deficit in the division playoffs. They go from the eight-yard line. Stan Humphreys will turn. Play action right off of one throw. The Chargers traveled to Pittsburgh as heavy underdogs in the 1994 AFC Championship game. We gotta play together, play hard. The coverage team stay here. Break on, win on three, one, two, three. Let us go. Trailing 13 to 10 in the fourth quarter, Humphreys again found a streaking mark. Leading 17-13, the Chargers were one defensive stop from the Super Bowl. Fourth down and goal from the three. Three wide receivers, John L. Williams in motion. Neil O'Donnell on a fourth down play to save the season to throw. Fire down! It's a blast out of the goal line by San Diego! The Chargers are going to the Super Bowl. In 1994, the Chargers advanced further than they ever had before. Unfortunately, Andre Coleman's 98-yard touchdown return was the lone highlight of Super Bowl XXIX. The Chargers could not keep up with the high-powered 49ers, and the dream season slipped away. Despite the Super Bowl loss, there was renewed confidence among Charger fans. Bobby Ross brought winning football back to San Diego, winning two division titles in five seasons with the Chargers. To make the playoffs for a third time under Ross, the Chargers had to prove they could win anywhere and in any conditions. Dodging snowballs and giant defenders alike, the Chargers prevailed, finishing the 95 season with a come-from-behind victory in hostile territory. Following the 1996 season, Ross resigned, and a new era of Charger football began. The Chargers entered the late 90s in transition and full of uncertainty. 
But after rookie quarterback Ryan Leaf won his first two starts, there was optimism in San Diego. Leaf struggled to maintain his early momentum and never reached his full potential. The Chargers suffered back-to-back -back losing seasons in 1997 and 1998 under two different head coaches. In 1999, new head coach Mike Riley lifted the Chargers to a promising 8-8 eight eight record. The team was led by one of the league's top defenses. Linebacker Junior Seau continued to anchor the unit with help from a rising star in the defensive backfield. Safety Rodney Harrison established himself as a physical and vocal leader. Let's start fast, man. Let's go out there. Let's communicate. Let's stay together. Let's make some plays, man. That's it, baby. Knock out, like I said before, baby. Man, we're going to do our job, all right? The former fifth-round pick became the most valuable player in the Chargers' secondary, garnering two Pro Bowls and two All-Pro selections as one of the most intimidating safeties in the NFL. Rodney Harrison, oh my good what an amazing effort. Good night, Rodney Harrison, what a player. <laughs> I'm going to take it off next time. Play fake, Stewart, back throwing, intercepted by Rodney. He can go, far side, Rodney Harrison, foot race, and he is gone. Harrison was an enforcer on the defense, but the heart and soul was Junior Seau. The San Diego native became the Chargers' hometown hero. Kyle, Junior, nice to meet you, all right? Thanks for coming out. Hey, cutie, how you doing? Give me five. You gave me good luck last time. You know that, right? What's your name? Give me five, Chris. Thanks for coming out, all right? All right. Seau was one of the most endearing players off the field. But on the field, he was a menace. In 13 seasons, number 55 was Charger defense. He was named All-Pro six times and was elected to 12 consecutive Pro Bowls. Say how? Sayle's lasting legacy is how he has helped countless youth in the community through his Sayle Foundation. In 2001, the Chargers extended Sayle's winning attitude to the front office with the hiring of general manager John Butler. I'd like to introduce the uh, new executive vice president, general manager of football operations at the San Diego Chargers, John Butler. The former Charger scout earned his reputation as a winner as a GM in Buffalo during the Bills' successful playoff runs of the 90s. In San Diego, Butler quickly began to upgrade the team by signing key free agents like quarterback Doug Flutie. Flutie, fake handoff, rolling right, looking end zone, escapes a sack, has it, running, goes in, touchdown! Oh, look at the little guy go. Doug Flutie looks like he's a 22-year-old rookie. Butler's biggest move came in the 2001 draft. When by swapping the first pick for the fifth pick, he altered the course in San Diego forever. That was the draft that set the Chargers on the course they are on now, which has made them the most talented team in all of football. The San Diego Chargers select Ladanian Tomlinson, running back from TCU. The Chargers then used their own pick in the second round to draft quarterback Drew Brees. Boy, Brees is just absolutely cut number rating. Cut number rating. Surgery right now. That's a lot to get when you give up the first pick and you take the fifth pick. In Ladanian Tomlinson, it was quickly apparent the Chargers had found a true gem. It was a real buzz, and you could tell from day one it was not going to take this young man long at all to make an impact. The handoff goes from Reed to LT, breaking left, cuts inside, breaks the tackle, slips another one, in the clear at the 30, at the 25, at the 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown Chargers! Well, I'm dead.
definitely not a bruiser. Uh, I guess I would be kind of a slasher. I'm more of a finesse runner. But I'm like slashing and dodging people. Roger fans, you're watching a future superstar. LT, 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 you're too dusty. That's insane. That is. That's off the chart. He is driving them crazy. Just so special, number 21. Playing defense, I love to sit back and, and be a fan and watch those feet. How do you stop a bowling ball? What time is it? LT time. Without a doubt, is the heart and soul of our franchise. Uh, ever since he's was drafted in 2001, uh, this whole franchise has turned around. Tomlinson is a multi-talent with breakaway speed. He is tough near the goal line, and he is an excellent receiver or passer. The best quarterback in the National Football League. In only eight seasons, LT already holds most of the team rushing records. After setting many Charger records, Tomlinson set his sights on the NFL record books. Touchdown, Ladanius Tomlinson! And with that touchdown, he is all alone for third place on the league's all time rushing touchdowns list, passing sweetness. The great Walter Payton. The biggest thing for me was passing Walter Payton. And uh, he scored a lot of them, but it, it was special for, for me to pass him. Tomlinson's off-the-field accolades are just as impressive. His community work contributed to him being named the 2006 NFL Man of the Year. Keep on running all the way to Canton, Ohio, big man. They'll be waiting for you whenever you decide you're ready. In 2002, the Chargers completed their winning foundation with new head coach, Marty Schottenheimer. Schottenheimer was a proven winner who summed up his philosophy with a simple three-word phrase. WWW. I looked at that as an acronym and said, wait a minute, you know, that WWW, we will win. Well, let's concentrate now. Focus, man. Stay square. Stay in front. Stay in front. There you go. Come on, work on the technique. Now, let's go. The energy level is excellent. It's excellent. We couldn't ask or expect any more. And what we have to do now is we got to begin to focus on the details. In Schottenheimer, the Chargers found immediate success as they began the 2002 season with four consecutive wins. A true sign that San Diego was about to turn a corner came against the defending champion, New England Patriots. He makes the throw. It's intercepted by Ryan McNeil. He'll give the LT. He broke a tackle. 45. Need field. Now 45. And still on his feet. Broke another tackle down the sideline. Needs a block. 25, 20, 15, 10. Gone. Touchdown. We need now to begin to expect to win. Expect to win. Every time you walk out that door to play the game, doesn't matter the arena, you expect to win. The Chargers were now ready to be winners. By 2004, San Diego was back on the road to the playoffs. How about those young lightning bolts? Look at the young men grow before our eyes. One of the key components of the Chargers' run to the postseason was the unexpected rise to stardom by tight end Antonio Gates. Planet that could cover Antonio 
Antonio Gates. Gates rose from undrafted free agent to pro bowler in only two seasons. Backing up, shovel pass, Gates! He's close! Touchdown! Not bad for a guy that wasn't drafted, huh? He became one of the best tight ends in the league and amassed 50 touchdowns faster than any other tight end in NFL history. In 2004, the second-year tight end's biggest catch came in Cleveland as the Chargers clinched their first division title since 1994. Touchdown, Chargers! Chargers are AFC West champions. How are you liking them now? In 2005, the Chargers became street busters. In week four, they ended the Patriots' 21 home game winning streak. Reaching touchdown, San Diego! Castle hit as he throws it, popped up and intercepted by Donnie Edwards. He laterals, and the Chargers take it down, field Clinton Hart, zigzagging, 10, 5, touchdown, San Diego! Their biggest achievement came in week 15, when they ended the Colts' quest for perfection. The Colts entered the game 13-0, and were thinking, perfect season. From the right hash, LT in the backfield, five-step drop, pump fake. Breeze over the middle, has a man, touchdown! Keenan the Cardell, and the Chargers on the board first. And no A fired-up defense sacked Colts quarterback Peyton Manning four times. Here comes the blitz. Peyton Manning down! He is down back at the 24-yard line. In a tight game of big plays, it was a timely run by Michael Turner that ruined the Colts' unblemished record. Michael Turner in the backfield here. Turner, Turner goes to the right side. He's got room. 30, 35, 40, 50. Down the sideline is the burner. Chase. 20-10-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-5-
That's how you allow a young quarterback to have success. You run it right down their throat. By the fourth quarter, Rivers had shaken any stage fright and was ready to show. Rivers back to throw. Look at end zone. Firing. Touchdown, Antonio Gates. San Diego now in control. Raider fans, thank you for coming. Good night. See you in a couple months. Rivers quickly settled into the role of starter. Well, that's a splendid pass by Philip Rivers. On target and on time. A lot of guys have talent when they come into the NFL. But the ones that go on to, to do great things, they're the ones that have the intangibles and the extras. Nice job, man. Hey, it's good, Daddy. On the player and a 52 fly to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why I stayed yeah. I knew he was going to. In Rivers, you have a true leader. You have somebody who the other players believe in. There's a trust that he can lead that team a long way. Number 17 went from starter to star in Cincinnati, with the Chargers trailing 28-7 at halftime. Rivers guided the offense to 42 second-half points to lead San Diego to a comeback win in front of a stunned crowd. San Diego does the lead! Incredible! Just as Rivers' stock was rising on offense, Sean Merriman was coming into his own on defense. Merriman began his career as Rookie of the Year in 2005 and became one of the premier defensive players in the league. Merriman got him his third of the day. It is sack number 17, and he will show this crowd that he loves his football. Defensive end Luis Castillo also blossomed. Castillo was drafted in the 2005 draft and quickly became a staple on the Chargers' defensive line. And here comes a rush. Down goes Trent Green at the 20-yard line. How about Luis Castillo? While the young stars shone bright, it was Ladanian Tomlinson who took stardom to a new level. In 2006, LT led the team to the AFC West title. And along the way, he took aim at the NFL's single-season touchdown mark. From the seven-yard line of the Denver Broncos. And the handoff to Tomlinson. Left side, and he will gallop into the end zone. Charger fans are witnesses to history. Twenty-nine touchdowns. And you know the best part is, he's as good a person as he is a player, and that's saying something. Great number 21, as humble as the day is long, celebrated with all of his teammates in the end zone. The silver coin, we squeezed it. Now, the gold coin is next. The gold coin is next. And that's going to take us some work. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't put anything by this group. <laughs> this group is as resilient as anybody I've ever been around. Congratulations. Under Schottenheimer, the Chargers never found their gold coin. Painful home playoff losses to the Jets and Patriots following the 2004 and 2006 seasons marred division championships and ownership decided it was time for a change. Prior to the 2007 season, San Diego turned to veteran head coach Norv Turner to get the Chargers over their playoff hump. Guys, you've got Will. Same deal. You've got Will. You've got to come get him. Guards down. It's power pass. What do you do? Z post. Z post. You got a zero. You either got to throw it or you got to throw the five. You can't throw it late. It's double coverage. Come on, man. You're leaning on each other. Play some football. Let's go. quickly had the Chargers headed towards another playoff appearance.
That year also saw the emergence of Antonio Cromartie, who made a name for himself in record-setting fashion by returning a missed field goal 109 yards for the longest scoring play in NFL history. Cromartie bringing it back down the sidelines. 45, 50, 40, 35, 30, put the move on. Cromartie to the house. Touchdown, San Diego. Unbelievable. Cromartie logged impressive stats in the defensive backfield as well. His three interceptions helped the Chargers to a key win over the defending champion Colts in San Diego's run to a second consecutive AFC West title. Three picks, one game, what a player! The 2007 AFC West champs are once again the San Diego Chargers. Watch as we run for the rest of this playoff run. We're going to make the run. It is playoff football from Qualcomm Stadium. Overcast, but good to go. It's 11-5 San Diego taking on 10-6 Tennessee. Trailing 6-0 to the Titans in the second half. It was a long pass that put the Chargers on the short track to victory. River looking. Has a man. There's Jackson at the 5. Curls towards the end zone. Diving. Touchdown. By Phillip Rivers and the Chargers have taken control. The defense held the Titans without a touchdown for the entire game, and Ladanian Tomlinson officially ended the playoff drought in San Diego. Here we go. Rivers hands it off. LT on the trampoline at the goal line, stretching, reaching. Touchdown! LT got it. Pack your bags for Indianapolis. Their first playoff win since January 15th. 1995. And I like their chances against the Colts. In the divisional round, the Chargers came to Indianapolis with few believing they could corral the Colts. An early injury to Tomlinson did little to boost confidence. Rivers took the mantle and guided the team into the lead heading into the fourth quarter. Rivers would also succumb to injury late in the game. A hobbled Philip Rivers heads towards the locker room. With their two stars sidelined, it would be up to the understudies to seal the underdogs a spot in the AFC Championship. 24-21 Indianapolis. Billy Bolick has to engineer the comeback. Bolick fakes the handoff. Goes underneath to Legadoo Nana. Gets a block from Marcus McNeil. Goes to the 30. Cuts up field. Breaks a tackle. 20. 15 yard line for Legadoo Nana. Nobody on this planet gives them any kind of a chance without Phillip Rivers, without LT, with the hobble gates. Bullock diving. Got his hand over the goal line. Yes, he is. Touchdown, Billy Bullock. And the San Diego Chargers are on top of Indianapolis. Our San Diego Chargers are coming in, and they've taken it away from the world champion. The Chargers entered the AFC Championship in New England, hoping their walking wounded could somehow overcome the undefeated Patriots. It is being billed as David against Goliath, and David's slingshot is in the shop. Injuries have all but swallowed these Chargers whole. With Tomlinson and Antonio Gates sidelined early and Rivers hobbled, San Diego still turned in a truly heroic performance. And Phillip in with the not one but two bad knees, which you figure a lacerated pancreas wouldn't have kept Rivers off his field this afternoon. The team also leaned upon an inspired defense. The Chargers have picked off Brady three times. What a play. In the end, the Chargers would fall just short of ending New England's perfect season. San Diego entered 2008 hoping to build upon their success, but they would be tested from the start. In Denver, the outcome of the game would be decided by something other than the Broncos. 38-31 San Diego, and Cutler rolling out, his pass knocked down, he lost it, it's picked up, the Chargers!
that just happened? Wait a minute. Wait, Jay Cutler's coming back on the field. How was that? Like, just an incomplete pass? I guess it's going to be called it. At the 10? That can't be right. Play should have been ruled a fumble. By rule, the ball was dead when it hits the ground because the whistle was blown. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's Denver's ball at the 10-yard line, which is the spot that the ball hit the ground. Third down. This game should be over. Cutler pumps one, fires end zone. 39-38 Denver. The Broncos have stolen one. It should have never come to this. The loss sent San Diego into a 4 and 8 tailspin. Though the Chargers were down, they refused to fold and finally found their resolve. I'm most proud of the way our entire group believed that, hey, we're not far away from being a real good football team. And it was a fight to get back to where we needed to be, but our guys uh, did a great job of fighting that fight. San Diego re-emerged as contenders in Week 14 against the Raiders. Rivers with time going long. Has Jackson streaking under the ball. Has it at the 20. In stride. 10, 5, touchdown, 59 yards. A week later, the Chargers showed heart by scoring a pair of last-minute touchdowns in Kansas City. San Diego made it three in a row by blasting the Buccaneers in Tampa. 15, 10, 5, touchdown! The lightning bug has done it again! Garcia back in the shot, and he flips it. It's going to be picked off on a bobble. It's Payson racing down the left sideline. The rookie looking to go. Antoine Payson, first NFL touchdown! The Chargers entered the final game of the season with a chance for revenge and a third straight AFC West title in a primetime showdown against the Denver Broncos. It all comes down to this. There's no team has ever started 4-8 and eight and still made the playoffs. The Chargers have their shot. Come on, 1-7. Come on, 1-7. Go we'll get some. Ready, ready. Ready. San Diego ready. sizzled from the start in a game that was never close. Rivers, the screen is full. Jams his way to the 10, to the 5. Keeps on going. Touchdown, San Diego. Yay! Yay! Another one for you. One seven, let's go. Phillip Rivers threw his 33rd and 34th touchdown passes of the season to eclipse Dan Fouts' team record for touchdown passes in a season. How do you like this Charger offense? The Damian Tomlinson officially buried the Broncos and their title hopes. The knockout punch! Touchdown, San Diego! San Diego has bolted from the quicksand and stolen this division. Jubilation filled Qualcomm Stadium as players and fans celebrated a third consecutive division title for only the second time in franchise history. We'll see you next week. Tune in! A week later, the Chargers entered the AFC wildcard as underdogs, despite playing at home against the Colts. With Tomlinson nursing an injury, Darren Sproul stepped in and stepped up. accounted for more than 200 yards of offense in an inspiring performance. Sproul's biggest run came just minutes into overtime. The overtime victory over the Colts exemplified the spirit and determination that has defined the San Diego Chargers for a half century. Since 1960, the Chargers have been a fixture in Southern California. It'd be hard to think of San Diego without the San Diego Chargers. When you see the lightning bolt, you think San Diego. 
where we're reminded of all the players because there's football cards of them that hang in the hallways. When you join an organization that has that kind of uh, tradition and history, it's really something special to walk through the hallways to see you know, guys like Lance Allworth, Dan Fouts, Kellen Winslow. You, you feel proud to be here. It certainly uh, makes you realize uh, how special it is to put on a charging uniform. From their early years as a fledgling flagship franchise in the AFL to the present day as a valued member of the NFL, the Chargers have always relied on the passionate support of the citizens of San Diego. see how excited the community and the town gets uh, on Sundays. It's a passionate relationship, and you can see that by just how involved our fans are at the game. This crowd is going nuts. We appreciate you fans providing the energy that we needed to get the job done. The Chargers history is a book full of stars. While the greats have come and gone over the years, they always find their way back home to San Diego. Here, they are more than just part of a team. They belong to a community and to a family. Most of all, they have earned their permanent place within the legend of the lightning bolt.